Okay, so we're very pleased to have uh, Dr. Jay Sosenko coming to us from University of South Florida, and his uh, talk today is going to be metabolic endpoints for type 1 diabetes prevention trials are not as simple as they seem. Um, sort of fresh off uh, this talk cites the, the new paper, Metab uh, Comparisons of Metabolic Measures to Predict Type 1 Diabetes versus Detect a Preventative tre Treatment Effect in High-Risk Individuals, uh, authored by Emily K. Sins. Uh, David Cuthbertson, Laura Jacobson, Heba Ishmael, Brandon, Brandon M. Nathan, Kevin C. Harold, Maria J. Redondo, and Jay Sosenko. A little bit about um, Dr. Sosenko. He finished his internal uh, medicine residency at UCLA, completed an adolescent medicine fellowship at Boston Children's Hospital. During his seven years there, he was involved both clinically and in research with adolescents who had type 1 diabetes. In addition, he obtained his degree in epidemiology from Harvard School of Public Health, and he subsequently joined the faculty at University of Miami with positions in general internal medicine and adolescent medicine. His research uh, interests initially focused on the epidemiology of diabetic neuropathy and full foot ulceration. However, after assuming the role of associate chair for ethics and epidemiology at the inception of TrialNet, which is an NIDDK funded consortium of investigators with the objective of developing treatments to delay or prevent type 1 diabetes. His research is really focused on the natural history and prediction of type 1 diabetes with the objective of finding, applying findings to type 1 diabetes prevention trials. And he also follows patients with type 1 diabetes in um, the adolescent uh, local uh, diabetes clinic at uh, USF. Um, so, uh, welcome, uh, Jay. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Thank you. Questions in the chat uh, during the context uh, or during the talk, and then at the end as well. So, thank you. Just, just one, there's one point of information. Actually, I'm at the University of Miami, not USF. The oh. coordinating center is the University of South Florida, but I've been at University of Miami for many years. So. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Thanks for That's the clarification. All right. That's all right. That's all right. Okay, well, um, let's get started. First of all, uh, I, I'd like to discuss the rationale for developing new treatments uh, and, and new endpoints for treatments. And um, uh, so firstly, teplizumab is the only treatment approved for the prevention of type 1 diabetes in the 20 plus years of Tronet's existence. And the question is why? Why haven't there been more successes? And one factor is the requirement of using uh, the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes as the only endpoint for the approval of a treatment. So this endpoint requires years of follow-up. And in fact, the teplizumab trial, uh, which again was the only trial that has been approved um, for, for treatment, uh, is uh, it took nine years to, uh, to complete. So it takes a very long time to perform these trials. Uh, the length of time to complete such trials is costly and can negatively impact the initiation of other trials. Uh, and finally, the development of endpoints additional to the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes could potentially shorten the time necessary for trials and ultimately provide a greater possibility of developing new preventive treatments. So let's move on. Let's see. Okay. First thing I'm going to do is talk about... Uh, some of the new newer endpoints that we've uh, just found over the years. And um, first I'll talk about index 60. Uh, I can't go into a, a lot of depth for in this talk about these different items, but uh, I'm just pretty much giving an overview. So index 60 uh, is based on a proportional hazards model, including uh, three variables, a log fasting C-peptide, the 60 minute C-peptide and the 60 minute glucose. Now, of course, we're used to the two-hour glucose for clinical purposes, but it turns out that the 60-minute C-peptide and the 60-minute glucose uh, values are stronger predictors of type 1 diabetes than the two-hour values, and that's in the diabetes prevention trial type 1. So that's, uh, I'm going to be discussing data mainly from the trial net data, but the diabetes prevention trial type 1 was a forerunner of trial net, uh, and it was composed of two trials an oral trial than a parenteral trial. I won't get uh, deeply into it, but uh, the, that database uh, is where uh, basically we formed uh, we formed index 60 from that database. Jay, After can I just test, clarify no, this? Uh, yeah. So so index 60 was, uh, you know, formed or began as a measurement in 2015? Yes, 2015, right, right. 
So after assessing several possible thresholds, uh, we decided to use a, a 2.0 threshold value, which doesn't mean much to you, but that's the value that would put someone at very high risk for type 1 diabetes. And we thought that would be sufficiently conservative uh, and based on the positive predictive value that was at least uh, equivalent to the two-hour glucose of 200, which is the clinical threshold for type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes, as it turns out. So uh, we developed this index. And then uh, in this paper in 2015, we uh, performed a study with it. And uh, we performed this in DPT-1, where we developed the measure, and in the trial net pathway to prevention study, which uh, I'll get more into more later. Uh, but in any case, we looked at incident or the first time someone was over the 2.0 threshold. If you look at the first column, index 60 positive, and also at that time was under the threshold for the two hour glucose, the diagnostic two hour glucose of 200. And then uh, we also looked at the people who first uh, had a a uh, incident two hour glucose greater than 200, two hour glue plus, but then had an index 60 at that time that was under 2.0. So one is purely an incident index 60, the other is purely two hour glucose. And what we find is that uh, from those uh, who were diagnosed, that 78% were diagnosed. Uh, with the index 60 positive, whereas 67 were diagnosed, 67% were diagnosed uh, with it, uh, index six, uh, two hour glucose positive. And in TrailNet, doing the same kind of study, we found that there was 70% versus 57%. So now remember, these, uh, these were six, uh, six month visits for, with OGTTs for follow up. And, um, and the idea was really to look, people were interested in uh, diagnosing diabetes. They weren't really even looking at index 60 at that time because nobody knew about it. So, so, um, so basically I'd say that the two hour glucose had an advantage, but here we're seeing that uh, because once you had a two hour glucose, then you were you know, automatically get a confirmatory test. Whereas if you had the index 60, uh, nobody bothered to do anything. So, here we, with the idea that index 60 really was kind of uh, sort of at a disadvantage, uh, we see it does somewhat better uh, at diagnosing type one diabetes than, uh, than the traditional two hour glucose measure. So another thing I'll just mention, there's a lot of things I, I could talk about, but I just wanna point out that those who, this is very important, <laughs> Of those who had index 60 positive to our glucose negative versus the opposite, uh, they, the difference in age was mark, marked. It was 12.9 years. They were much younger, the ones who had incident index 60 versus the ones who had incident to our glucose, but index 60 negative. That was, it's a huge difference in age and it's very meaningful, I think. So, and something to keep in mind. And what I think this starts to point to is that index 60. I, I think uh, is, and I, you know, I, I might be biased. <laughs> I'm an epidemiologist, but I might be biased. And um, I, I think that this suggests that index 60 might be more specific to um, what the pathogenesis of type one diabetes is. So now I'm gonna talk about another item, which uh, is not an endpoint in itself, but it's something that I think is very important in what we've been doing. And these are called glucose and C-peptide response curves. This was a paper uh, that was published uh, last year. And uh, this paper looked at zones that were based on five glucose categories. These are all uh, uh, non-diabetic and five uh, C-peptide categories in autoantibody positive individuals. And what you see is that um, you see these shapes, and the shapes uh, uh, actually are uh, shapes of OGTTDs, oral glucose tolerance tests, and I'll explain. So here basically is the, uh, the open circle is a 30-minute value. Let me go to this one because it might be easier to see. Is a 30-minute value, and then 
the next is a 60 minute, 90 minute and 120 minute value. So these are the values uh, that were uh, that were made up the OGTT. And you can see there was a C-peptide measurement and a glucose measurement for, for these. And in the center of this uh, shape is what's called a centroid. And that's the center, basically the central shape of uh, center of the uh, of the of the GCRC, uh, and uh, without it goes, it's all, I you know you're welcome to read the paper, but there's a lot to say about it. But basically, uh, this is these are cross sectional data. You can do this longitudinally, but you can see uh, without again going into it that the shape of the OGTT changes as the glucose increases. So what you see is that there's a, a, a counterclockwise rotation to the shape. And these are characteristic that you see uh, as people uh, go on to develop uh, diabetes. You see these changes in shape. And actually, we'll get more into it, but I use that. Uh, we've used that, I, I think, to advantage in studies that we've done. I'm also going to be talking about vectors and angles. And the... Um, Okay, so this is uh, basically a post hoc analysis of the two oral insulin trials that were negative, that were performed, one in DPT1 and the other one in trial net. So they were both overall negative, but uh, doing this post hoc analysis, uh, we found that if you had a DPTRS, that's a, a risk score that we've developed, uh, actually that predated index 60, and that had... Uh, it also had C peptide, not the same exact variable as C peptide uh, fasting, uh, C peptide uh, that was actually the sum of C peptide of the OGTT values. And also um, uh, it included the sum glucose and it included uh, the A age and BMI. So that was again done with a, by a regression analysis. So you see there were 53 individuals in DPT1 who were placebo, who had greater than 6.75. And that's very, people are at very high risk for type one diabetes. Uh, and, and, the, uh, and those on oral insulin had a, uh, we were 37. Now, these are what, these are the vectors I've been discussing. And uh, I don't have, these are not from GCRC centroids. These are from AC, AUC glucose uh, as the, uh, for the, uh, Ordinate and AC uh, C peptide for the abscissa. And you see here, uh, these are people who were the placebo group. And you can see in one year what happened that their glucose went up and their uh, C peptide went down just slightly, but their glucose went much higher than those who were on oral insulin. And uh, I don't, I have statistical measures here, but basically these were statistically significant differences, however you wanted to look at it. And, uh, and so this tells you basically, if you look really at what's going on here, the oral insulin uh, group is actually increasing their glucose to a lesser extent than the placebo, but they're also actually increasing their C-peptide. And we did this in TRONET also, and you see it's similar. Uh, the glucose goes precipitously higher in, uh, in, the, uh, in the placebo group, uh, and the C-peptide goes up in both, but more so in the oral insulin group. So basically, it, this it gives you a gestalt base to show that uh, it appears that uh, oral insulin is uh, benefiting subjects. Now, this is post, post hoc, so uh, it, it, there's a lot of issues with that, but um, it suggests, one, that there may be an effect, and two, it's sort of an interesting way, I think, of sort of looking, besides just looking at numbers, looking at the vectors and, and what's happening. So now I'm going to go to another measure, and um, these are called within quadrant endpoints, WQE and ordinal directional endpoints, ODE. Uh, these are uh, somewhat complex in the way they were developed. Uh, uh, this paper is uh, Emily Sims and I uh, and others. And by the way, Kevin Harold, Emily and I 
have been mainly involved with this, but Kevin, of course, has been involved to a large extent also. So, um, and just to just briefly mention, uh, each of these measures quantifies risk from vectors indicating change of centroids. And I pointed out the centroid is the central point of the GCRC over time. So you look at a GCRC, say at baseline, a GCRC at six months, and you look at the centroids and you connect the two centroids by a vector. And each uses angles of vectors from trigon uh, trigonometric functions uh, to come up to quantitate, uh, to have a quantitative value. And each is used to compare vectors between placebo and treatment groups and for other reasons also. So I'll, maybe this will sink in a little bit as I show you more. So this is, again, a, a study I did with Emily. And um, this, I think, was an interesting study. What we looked at was people who had uh, DPTRS levels at similar, uh, similar values of DPTRS levels at baseline. And these individuals had, in this slide, had DPTRS levels less than 7.0. So they're not exactly in great shape, but they uh, but they're in better control or have lower glucose values than the ones who are above seven, which you'll see in a minute. So here you see uh, that these individuals, if you look at the ones in red who were diagnosed versus those who were not diagnosed, non-progressors, and looked at their last visit, you can see there's a marked difference as you might expect, uh, and what happened was the ones who were diabetic had a very marked interest in, in uh, increasing glucose uh, with maybe very slight drop in C peptide. By the way, if, if it was really a more normal, you'd see the glucose going up with the C peptide. But um, so the, relatively, um, the C peptide really is falling. If you look at the blue, which is the non-progressors, uh, you see that the glucose is going up to some extent, but not nearly to the extent uh, that it went up in the uh, progressors. And also you see the C-peptide going up. It looks a lot like what we saw with the, uh, the, uh, with the, uh, in, in the oral insulin trials when we compared placebo and oral insulin. Uh, interestingly. And another point to mention is when you look at these GCRCs, remember I showed you how as you uh, look in this cross-sectional, at this cross-sectional slide, you see that there's a, uh, a, a, a counterclockwise rotation uh, as things get worse or as glucose goes higher. But here now we see it longitudinally, the same th thing happening. The ones who were getting diabetes had this counterclockwise rotation uh, of the uh, of the GCRC, and again, this gives us some natural history information that we wouldn't have otherwise. Here, with the uh, looking at the non-progressors, uh, the shape is is pretty much the same, so we don't see as much of that rotation. And again, it's a more benign uh, development where you see the glucose going up just somewhat and the C-peptide actually increasing. Now, these are individuals who had greater than 7.0 uh, DPTRS. So these are individuals who are in um, very poor shape in terms of their risk for type 1 diabetes. Uh, here we see the same kind of picture, though, interestingly, even though they're at different uh, levels compared to the other slide. And again, you see the upward increase the upward rise in the uh, glucose, and you see a, a less of a rise uh, in the non-progressors. And again, this is vertical, but, uh, with the, but the fact that the glucose is higher means that it's really not, uh, the C-peptide's kind of not so good. And here we see the C-peptide going up with the, uh, with the glucose. So it, it's strikingly, it, it looks a lot like, his, this is natural history, this is not intervention. It's, it's strikingly similar to what you see for the oral insulin. Quick uh, question, um, yeah. PRJ, from the audience from Maria Redondo. Why does the C-peptide increase? Is it because of increasing age with time? That's a really good question. You know, I work closely with Maria, and, and I think she knows the answer, we, which is the answer is we don't know. And there's two real possibilities. When you talk about age, 
uh, you're thinking, well, maybe it's going up uh, within because there's insulin resistance. And, uh, and that could be the reason. And or it could be that there's some recovery of beta cell function. The, the bottom line is that the C peptide is increasing. So the beta cells have the ability to increase and respond. If it is insulin resistance, that's the stimulus. The beta cells uh, can respond to it. But we, it's a really good question, and we we don't have the answer. Uh, and I, I, I think we will have it so, at some point, but not yet. Well, I mean, you could ask also, like, if you think about the type one diabetes is a relapsing, remitting disease across time, right? So maybe, <clears throat> maybe as um, people relapse or go into the disease, then they have sort of this curve. They have this, um, you know, counterclockwise curve, but then maybe they have some recovery for a while and well, then they dip well, back yeah. into disease and then they have some recovery and then they are diagnosed. I don't know. Right. It's very possible that that there's, uh, I happen to think there's some compensation here for the glucose uh, that it's, uh, but here, uh, if we look at the, the non-progressors, it's these people will eventually, there, many of them will be progressed to diabetes. And then you'll see that their things are going to go like this. Mm -hmm. But uh, these are people. Remember, we didn't uh, we followed them till the end of the study, and we don't know what happened afterwards. Uh, many of these people, based on what we know, could go many years like this. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of mystery still. But um, another question know, from yeah. uh, Alexis Karmer: Could similar conclusions be made? by just using fasting C-peptide and CGM data with normal eating patterns? I don't think uh, you could get the resolution nearly like this with fasting C-peptide. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think so. You, you really need stimulated um, measurements to get to this. So I'm gonna move on. Alrighty. Yeah, it's, it's really okay. interesting. And now I'm going to get to the teplizumab prevention trial. And uh, and this is actually what uh, the reason I was asked to give this talk. <laughs> but I thought that we needed this background. Anyway, uh, the, the trial in the teplizumab prevention trial was a randomized controlled trial, 14 days, uh, uh, and compared teplizumab with placebo uh, for time to type 1 diabetes. And individuals were greater than eight years old and they had a greater than or equal to two antibodies with this glycemia, which is an abnormal glucose below the threshold for diabetes and a family history of type one diabetes. Uh, now the Tronet prevention, uh, the Tronet pathway to prevention study, TNPTP, I mentioned that briefly before, uh, and that is the heart of Tronet basically and where the trials emanate from. And this is an ongoing longitudinal observational study in which individuals with a family history of type 1 diabetes are screened for islet autoantibodies. Those positive for multiple islet antibodies are followed at six or 12 month intervals with two hour glucose tolerance tests for diagnostic surveillance. And um, these people are in the study, but they uh, it, once they qualify for a prevention trial, uh, they could go into that trial and then they will no longer be in this study. But, How many people are in that study currently, Jay? Well, we have, uh, I can tell you that we have data on um, over probably at this point, it's probably 7,000 or so who've actually had screening. Uh, but um, but there are many people who are not followed because their antibodies are negative. Mm -hmm. uh, so you would have something like, Maria can correct me, but something like 5% your relatives, the people who are screened are relatives of type one patients and something like four or five percent might have, um, uh, and that's a ballpark, uh, positive antibodies and then be eligible for follow-up. Uh, so we followed many, many people um, and many, many have been diagnosed over the years who have been in the TNPTP. Okay, so now these are, uh, this is again, a study that Emily and, and Kevin and I and Dave Cuthbertson performed. And I mentioned the WQE, which is the within quadrant endpoint, which doesn't mean much to you. Uh, the, this is a six month measure that's built in as a, as a, measure, a, a measure of change. It's built into this 
and the uh, oral uh, oral dementia. It's not oral. <laughs> It's the, the ordinal, ordinal uh, direction or, or, end ordinal point. dimensional endpoint. <laughs> yeah. Well, we did read the paper. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> anyway, so uh, these um, these show that basically when we look at six month value, and these are three month uh, values actually, and the Helplizma tri trial, and this was post post hoc analysis, uh, we see that the, the the higher the value, the worse off you are. The year was a, the placebo group had a higher value for the WQE and um, unadjusted significant, but not uh, significant adjusted. The ODE uh, was again, uh, the plizumab group was in, um, in better shape and, and um, they were significant with adjustment. We also looked at the uh, AUC ratio, the change, this is the change over the, six, the first six months, baseline to six months. Uh, and um, and uh, I'm sorry, baseline to three months. And we see that there was, uh, again, a decline uh, in the placebo, which means since the C-peptide was in the numerator, uh, it meant that they were doing more poorly and the teplizumab group was doing better. And this was significant. And index 60 was uh, also uh, significantly improved. So again, if this goes, the higher this is, the worse off you are. So again, the placebo, uh, the uh, teplizumab group was in better shape and it was significant. Now we're looking at the six month visit. And here, interestingly, remember these were actually uh, six month values and we applied them to three month data. But here now we see the WQE and the ODE are actually doing better than the AUC ratio and index 60. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and I think um, it's of interest, when we look at another slide, you'll see why I think it, these might have done better than the others. Now, this, this is one of my favorite slides ever. I don't know how many slides I've made in my uh, years. I'm only 30 years old, so, you know. <laughs> But was, was someone laughing? I'd like to know who was laughing. No, I'm just I'm, I'm laughing. These are the favorite slide. Uh, this well, is they're they're quite beautiful works of art. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> no, I, I'm being a little facetious, but it really is is neat because this this tells the teplizumab story. I think this was not this was a post hoc analysis, but basically it's showing these vectors and. If you look at the placebo, uh, this vector is moving actually into a, a, a bad spot. It's moving, the, the C peptide is going down and the glucose is going up. And yet almost 180 degrees, we see uh, a different, we see that the teplizumab is uh, increasing the C peptide and decreasing the glucose, suggesting and again, I don't want to get, get carried away that maybe teplizumab, whoops, I'm sorry. That maybe teplizumab is uh, actually uh, improving their state. Uh, but I, I, it's hard to, I think, ever see a study like this, which had such a, 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 a like a, a, a tremendous impact. And I can, and, and it's visually, when you look at these vectors, you can see. Now the WQE and the, and the ODE were devised so we can quantitate what we're seeing here, and they were both uh, highly uh, significant. So, um, uh, and, and I have to say these endpoints are still in the process of being evaluated, and they probably, some are better for other st certain studies and some are better for other studies. So, but for this study, uh, the WQE and the ODE, I think, did quite well. So now the question is, what is the best short-term surrogate uh, for the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes? And here are some candidates that we could use on some of our old friends, the AUC glucose, AUCC peptide, the ratio, the A1C, the 30 minus 0 minute C peptide, index 60. These are the yellow, the newer ones. WQ. I don't see the CGM on there. Is that because it's not relevant? Uh, <laughs> I, CGM was not uh, something that we had uh, much of at Toronto at this time, but I'm, I am working with CGM right now. So, and we're looking at that as a predictor too. 
Uh, right. So I don't want to, I'm not discounting CGM at all. Okay. That's a good question. I'm glad you mentioned it. Okay, so now this shows the groups. And again, it was the teplizumab placebo group and the treatment group, and then the uh, pathway to prevention study. And um, just to explain this, the uh, we looked at the uh, comparison of the to, to plizumab and, and uh, the placebo and the treatment group to look at, to detect a treatment effect. That's the detection of a treatment effect. For the TNPTP, we took the same, uh, the people who were not in the trial, in the teplizumab trial, but had the same criteria for entry into the teplizumab trial. And um, so they were greater than eight and they had the other items that I mentioned, uh, two or more antibodies, uh, dysglycemia, et cetera. And there were 174 in trial net. So for this group, we looked at their prediction of type one diabetes after say from baseline to six months, we looked at the change and we then looked at the change in the, uh, in the metabolic variable as it predicted type one diabetes. And, and it, you see here in the, uh, again, in the ordinate, you see the type one diabetes prediction and it's the chi-square represents the, uh, the value that we're looking at here. And, and all of these were significant in terms of prediction. But you can see there was wide diff uh, large differences in uh, in their ability to predict. And the best predictor was AUC glucose. Uh, it did better than index 60 and AUC C peptide or AUC glucose. But just to show you how complicated this is, this was change over six months. Index 60 from baseline is a much better predictor of type 1 diabetes than is the AUC glucose. But here uh, in this analysis, looking at change <laughs> over six months, uh, as a predictor, uh, AUC glucose did best. And then here were the combined measures of AUCC peptide and AUC glucose, which did pretty well for prediction and did better for detection. So the higher the T, I didn't mention the T value would be, the higher that is, the better the detection of treatment. And they were all significant also. You see the AUCC peptide and the 30 minus zero minute C peptide were way down here. And the ODE and the WQE, and remember, this is teplizumab. So they did the best for, uh, for detection, but they weren't the best for prediction. So it's sort of a dilemma in a way, because when I would have thought simplistically that if we're looking for a surrogate for type 1 diabetes, to me, it would be the best predictor. But it doesn't work out that way. Um, AUC yeah. glucose was the best predictor, but... And I'll show you something here. It's, I think it was really sort of like, you know, said succinctly or very well in the paper that basically there was a paradox, right? Glucose appears to perform more effectively for predicting type 1, but glucose uh, performs less effectively for detecting treatment. Exactly. Exactly. And, so that's and really he, strange. <laughs> well, I think I can explain it to some extent. But here you see, it, it, this is the best Predict, breast predictor is glucose, which is red. Mm -hmm. And you see what happens for detection. It's the worst at detection, which is amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I get carried <laughs> away from the data sometimes, so it's not professional, but, you know, what can I say? So here now, but we look here, say, at the, uh, at the WQE, for example, it was not so good for prediction, uh, but it was the best for detection of a treatment effect. So I think we can't just say, uh, we certainly can't say the best predictor is the best at detecting a treatment effect. And um, and I, I'll try to, uh, I think I'll get to what I think is going on here. But um, now this is, uh, see, Maria didn't know she was going to be in, in this uh, talk, <laughs> but this is from <laughs> Maria Redondo's study. And I, I can I think this is a very interesting study. I, I, this is sickening that I keep saying this, I think. But anyway, this is um, what, what we did here was a look at people who were screened with OGTTs in, in TrialNet. And you couldn't, uh, if, you, if you had a, a diabetes range, uh, glucose, you could not go into the TNPTP. It was only people who were 
autoantibody positive, but not in the range of diabetes. So these dashed lines are the GCRC at the uh, at baseline. And you can see there's a real difference in the GCRCs in, 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 in here. And this represents, what I'm pointing here, are people who had at baseline had were greater than 2.0, so that it was a diabetic range for index 60, uh, but did not have a diabetic range for the uh, two-hour glucose. Here, these are people, again, at baseline who had greater than 200 at baseline, uh, but had an index 60 that was less than two. So here is index, whoops, oops. Here is index 60, and here is uh, the uh, two-hour glucose alone. And you can see that there's a huge difference. The two-hour glucose has a much wider, much wider GCRC than, and, and if the C-peptide is way out, uh, way to the, to, the, uh, to the right compared to uh, index 60. Now, interestingly, we looked at these people when they were finally diagnosed with diabetes, and um, and the you can see here that this is index sixty, and this is what happens when they were uh, diagnosed. They were here, and you can see what's happening. And this is, by the way, what you see uh, as people develop diabetes. There's a not just the, the uh, countercurrent rotation, but also the straightening of the GCRC. Uh, and when you, when, this is all new to you, but when you think about it, it all makes sense that the C-peptide is not going up, but the glucose is going up. So you wind up with the straightening. Uh, you see here, though, uh, you don't see quite as much straightening uh, when you look at the two-hour glucose from baseline to uh, when it's the diabetes is diagnosed. Now, this these are people who had both uh, the two-hour glucose over 200 and the uh, and the glu and, and the uh, and the index 60 greater than two at baseline. And these are very interesting because these were not diagnosed at baseline, and they were diagnosed subsequently. But you can see that they hardly changed. That mm -hmm. these people who had both really, in all essence had diabetes at uh, baseline, yeah. uh, but they weren't diagnosed. And the lesson you may can derive from that is that if people have both of these above threshold, you might not have to uh, perform a confirmatory test, uh, but I'm not advocating that. I'm just uh, postulating that possibility. So I think uh, again, um, but it's important to point out, again, remember we mentioned the age difference uh, and people who had uh, two point, uh, greater than 2.0, but less than 200 uh, in the other slide uh, versus those who had greater than 200 and less than 2.0. And, uh, and I think um, you can see that this is a manifestation of that, that here uh, in this group, these are older and almost certainly more insulin resistant and have higher C-peptide levels. Yet they would be they're antibody positive. These individuals on the left are uh, people who are much younger, and these are more prototypically type one uh, patients, whereas these are not prototypic. So, uh, so to answer, uh, I think it, it might have been Monica who asked, asked that question. Why uh, you see that discrepancy between glucose and the other variables? Because I think glucose uh, is a great predictor because glucose is predicting glucose. T type 1 diabetes is a glucose-only measure. And, uh, and glucose is predicting glucose. But that doesn't mean that it's... So that, that raises a question about specificity of the standard diagnostic measure we're using, which is a glucose-only measure. And the reason we're seeing detection, I think, of these med like teplizumab, which is a mechanistic treatment to prevent, uh, actually to prevent beta cell loss, is because we're seeing that, uh, that, that these combination measures, like index 60, are more specific for type 1 diabetes.
So I, you know, I sort of hedge a lot, but I'm not hedging there. I haven't proven anything, but I pretty much feel that way. <laughs> okay, now this is a slide that I, this came hot off the press. And I think this is very interesting also, and it goes along with what we've been saying. And here, um, again, I'm looking at index 62.0 in the teplizumab trial as an endpoint. I also looked at index 60 greater than 1.5, which is, again, a pretty high value thinking, well, maybe we'll see something with this as an endpoint also, because I've been uh, concentrating on 2.0. Now, these people, if, pe if an individual had greater than 2.0 at baseline, they were excluded from the follow-up. So they had to have index 60 less than two. And if they had greater than 1.5, they were excluded. So there would be more people excluded in the teplizumab trial if they were greater than 1.5. So the number is less. And these are the number of uh, events where the value went over threshold. And here, uh, and for 2.0, we see uh, in this here, they, there are very few people eliminated in the uh, excluded in the in the index sixty greater than two group, uh, so you're, and you're kind of slicing your data a little thinner here. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but it's very close. Mm -hmm. uh, and for type one diabetes, are 74, 48 for a seventy four, so these are pretty close. The proportion who developed uh, diabetes by this measure versus this. Now again, they were looking for type one diabetes. They weren't looking for index sixty, and these were getting confirmatory tests. And these weren't, but it's interesting because these were not confirmed yet. Um, you'll see that I think they did at least as well as type one diabetes, uh, the, the index 60 did. And here we see, these are the hazard ratios. So 0.5 means basically a 50% reduction in the risk. <clears throat> and these are confidence intervals, 95%. And this was significant. Uh, there was a significant effect, not adjusted. So we did see, uh, even though the number was much less, we do see a significant effect. But it's important to point out that uh, th these were um, these hazard ratios weren't uh, great, especially when we look at the 2.0. When we look at the 2.0, <clears throat> we see that the hazard ratio was 39 compared to 0.5, and the p-value was lower, and with the adjustment, the hazard ratio adjusted for index 60 baseline for age and BMI, you see that the hazard ratio drops uh, precipitously. So uh, basically, there's approximately 75% uh, decline in risk uh, with the adjusted. Uh, you don't see much decline here. Uh, now, when we look at the glucose, the glucose does a little better, not really, it's basically the same p-values. But interestingly, when you look at the hazard ratio, um, the index 60 does better than T1D. And with, with the adjustment, T1D doesn't really improve very much. But um, when I say improve, actually it means get, get worse. Uh, but the index 60 gets much worse. So, if, and I, I think that uh, people can disagree, but I think the adjusted measurements are the ones that are, are most uh, crucial. And um, I think it's, you see the p-value is much lower also. I is, can't, this, is this yeah. fairly typical to use these types of adjusted values? Uh, yes, now in trials. In clinical trials. In, in clinical trials, uh, they uh, might adjust for certain variables, but they generally don't do... Uh, adjustments, uh, but they, again, it, it varies with what they're doing, but I'd say uh, these adjustments, I think, are fair game uh, that we use to be uh, adjusting for baseline values. So this certainly improved with the adjustment for baseline. And you really, you know, you're not, uh, when you're, if you look, actually, if you look at the baseline data, I could show it to you. Index 60 and the glucose was both AC glucose was both higher in the placebo group than in the uh, treatment group. So basically, I'm, not, I'm sorry, I have it opposite, was higher in the treatment group than the placebo group. Uh, placebo group. So the treatment groups were at a disadvantage. Uh, so the adjustment uh, sort of works well in that sense. So I, uh, but I think this is something to keep in mind. And, um, and I now will 
just end this quickly. Uh, in post hoc studies, metabolic measures have shown potential as short term endpoints in type 1 diabetes prevention trials. The best predictor of type 1 diabetes might at first appear to be the best surrogate. However, using data from the teplizumab trial and TNPTP, analyses of short term endpoints indicate that there can be large disparities between the capacity to predict type 1 diabetes and the capacity to detect the treatment effect. As an example, change in AUC glucose was the best at prediction, but the worst at detection. Measures of glucose and C-peptide in combination tend to be better at detecting a treatment effect while also having the capacity to predict type 1 diabetes. These findings do not necessarily generalize as very important to other experimental treatments. However, other studies suggest uh, as I've shown you, that measures of glucose alone lack specificity for, teach for features of type 1 diabetes. I can show you other studies which actually have, are even uh, more confirmatory of this. And finally, studies also suggest that combined glucose and C-peptide measures have potential for use as diagnostic measures. Uh, advantages. So what are advantages? I'm not talking about disadvantages, but advantages here. What are advantages for type 1 diabetes without the fine follow-up, which is what we use basically in prevention trials? The clinical relevance is known. We know that once you go over that level, you're going to get complications if you, you know, if you're not, if you're not kept in good control, et cetera. These are necessary for FDA approval. So this is very important. Uh, I, I, that's an advantage for sure, uh, for use it for, for using that as an endpoint. And of course. These are standard clinical criteria that have been used for decades. And, uh, and actually, uh, the idea here is only glucose matters. Now, metabolic, uh, metabolic measures with defined follow-up, such as three months, six months, or a year, uh, I haven't mentioned this, but they could be used for, for stopping rules, shorter trials, more specific for secretory deficiency, and that's if glucose and C-peptide are combined, more specific for effect mechanism, if glucose and C-peptide are combined and can better discern the timing of effect. So we don't really learn about timing of effect by looking simply at the, uh, at the end point of type one diabetes, but we can looking at these metabolic measures. And here are some suggestions that I have because, we, so what do we do with this whole morass and this mess of things here? Well, the goal is to provide a means for assessing new endpoints that could ultimately facilitate trial performance without hampering the regulatory approval process. So this is sort of a compromise here. So continue using time to stand the standard diagnosis of type 1 diabetes as a primary endpoint. This is currently necessary to obtain approval for a preventive treatment. So we don't want to get rid of that. Consider adding another alternative time to diagnose this primary endpoint preferably with glucose and C-peptide in combinations such as index 60. This would provide a means to compare the type 1 diabetes endpoint with an alternative that could potentially provide an earlier and more sensitive detection of efficacy. Third, consider adding another primary endpoint, preferably with glucose and C-peptide in combination, that has a fixed follow-up of one year or less. This could provide more flexibility for detecting the timing and mechanism of an effect. If somehow having more than one primary endpoint is offensive, uh, the additional endpoints above could be termed secondary rather than primary endpoints. But if they are incorporated into protocols and examined prospectively, uh, they, they should be incorporated into protocols and examined prospectively so that they are not relegated to post hoc analyses, which is what we have to live with now. And people look askance at us for showing these data. So I think it's time to try to do something to, to keep the type 1 diabetes and current endpoint as a primary endpoint. But let's add other primary endpoints, uh, maybe not at this point, that will satisfy the regulatory agencies, but will at least allow us prospectively to really test these endpoints and, and, and test them as especially as they compare to uh, what the standard is. And I think we should do it for both uh, the uh, primary endpoint, the, the diagnostic endpoint, alternative endpoint, and also an alternative endpoint that has a fixed timing. So um, I think that's it. And I probably talked too long, but I'm sorry. No, it was, it was great. Um, I had a quick question.
in the paper, you kind of uh, point to this idea of an ideal surrogate endpoint. Um, you know, and I mean, how, are you saying that 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 surrogate is going to be the secondary endpoint, really? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually we could. What I mean about it, why I say a primary endpoint, I want to elevate it. Um, not necessarily again for regulatory reasons, but so that we really can um, look at this in a prospective way and think seriously about possibly eventually using these. Now, I wanted to say this also, that um, the, the fixed endpoint is actually a, a better way, I think, of assessing mechanistic effects. So um, the, the type 1 diabetes endpoint really doesn't get at mechanism at all. Uh, whereas I think um, here we could look at the short-term endpoint uh, and look at different endpoints and see which ones seem to work and which ones don't, which might give a, a, a seclude to mechanism. Um, I did want to ask this other question. So if we talk about like the idea of doing a combo of glucose and C-peptide measurement, um, when, you know, glucose is measured uh, in the clinic or in the, you know, clinical setting and the C-peptide is sent out to, um, you know, sort of industrial measurement. I, in your study, you used Tosh Biosciences in, in California. But what is what is the deal with the standardization of, of both of these across all data collection agencies? Is it standardized or is there room for improvement? I'm not an expert at this, but um, I, I know that the assays have been developed, and I Maria might run away in, but I think they're the C peptide is getting is is quite well standardized now, um, and um, I think there's a real push for that. Of course, and this is the scientific community. I mm -hmm. can't really speak to uh, what's going on with the clinical labs, uh, I, I, but I'm I'm pretty sure that just like A1C, that um, it's getting more standardized. Uh, Maria, do you want to weigh in? Um, I have to say that I was uh, reading Matthias' question on the and then kind of um, asking my question based on that. So the question is on C peptide assay. Yes, yes. are those yes. assays are you, are you, are you standardized? Confident, both, are you confident from a research perspective and a clinical perspective uh, that they're sta reasonably standardized? See, it is very tricky to measure, and one really has to adhere to a very strict protocol. We are, you know, doing this uh, for one of my studies here, and you know, it has to be processed within three hours, kept in cold. So definitely, uh, you know, it is very important to standardize and to to have it done by a lab that uh, is, you know, has uh, high high standards. So I think it's a good point that see, but, uh, that I, I, but when you say the research community, pretty much. Uh, you know, the Toronto community and, and say, oh, yeah. Nodia, they have the same standards. Oh, right? absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. And Matthias, do you want to unmute yourself or I can ask this question? Okay. He's not. I will ask you. I, he has two questions, Matthias von Herath. Um, In the ACD3 trials, the changes in HbA1c following treatment were usually a bit underwhelming and dissociated from C-peptide for example, compared to what we found with GLP-1S and, uh, let's, sorry, I have to scroll down, uh, AIL-21, could it be that dampening the immune attack only addresses the immune aspect of T1D, in parentheses, so beta cells can produce more insulin, but not the beta cell dysfunctional dysfunction regulation aspect, including crosstalk with alpha cells? Let's go with that question first, then I'll do the next one. Yeah, I think that goes along with uh, what I, I've been saying pretty much. I think that um, it's specificity uh, is, is very important here. Okay. And then the second question is, the pathology between young and adult diabetes looks quite similar, except that immune infiltration is less. Is that maybe the reason that ACD3 uh, tends to be less or not effective, as effective in adults? Uh, I... <laughs> I think it's it's speculative, but I, again, um, I, I think it has to do with. Um, I, I think it has to do. I, I think I think there. The other the other thing I'll, I'll say is that, and I've been working on this, and I don't want to really get into it, but I think there are, uh, there are two populations, at least two populations of glucose, 
or two com two components, and one is one is uh, basically a function of insulin secretion, and the other is independent of insulin secretion. I've been uh, we've actually published some abstracts on this, mm -hmm. and I, I think that uh, that really uh, and and they if you look at them individually, the one that's independent of insulin secretion, and I think there's pretty good evidence that we we can uh, actually isolate or uh, identify this uh, this component is uh, basically uh, does not cor doesn't correlate with features of type one diabetes very well at all. And one that's really interesting is um, that that independent fraction has no relation whatsoever with dr three dr four, whereas the dependent fraction, which is dependent on secretion. Is does relate to dr three dr four, so it's the HLA risk groups, and then so um, Brandon Nathan, who's also an author on the paper, he had his hand up. Do you want to unmute, uh, Brandon? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. And and I was just going to add because I think these are all excellent questions and I things that we. So. Oh no, no problem. Um, I, I think these are all questions that we we still ponder and and are working on addressing. Um, and Maria knows this better than than anyone, but but I think the notion of uh, all type one diabetes patients are created equal is uh, is not true. I think we we all understand that. And there's different groups, whether you look at age or specific biomarkers or specific immunologic markers that underline different uh, either patho. Uh, biologic mechanisms of progression to disease, the pace or rap rapidity that they progress to disease. And a lot of the, uh, one of the things that I think working with Jay that has been uncovered for me personally is that when you look at these larger groups, the effects of different interventions and uh, metabolic markers are can be washed out by having a more heterogeneous group that you're applying this to. So when you start looking at, well, what are these different, you know, groups of individuals who are at risk for progression, like uh, Matthias was implying here, and then you can use these some of these metabolic markers to look at specificity of progression or the uh, effect of an intervention. So like. Uh, immunotherapy um, within these these different you know categories or or framework of of patients that's where i think we want to get to that's where i think we can really see how effective some of these interventions can be in different uh, members of these groups if there's overlap with different members of these groups and if there are people like jay was mentioning who have you know a higher independent fraction of glucose that that maybe respond better to things like GLP-1 agonists or or therapies that that are really more designed towards the type two population. I, I think that's where we're where we're trying to get to. But but there is a lot of overlap and complexity in, in looking at all these different yeah. subgroups. We were just uh, covering the NPOD meeting, and that was brought up in terms of when there was a Shark Tank discussing how should um, you know standards be incorporated in terms of staging. Um, the progression to disease, and one of the uh, David Harlan actually spoke about how he, you know, he feels like maybe it should all be called just diabetes, so that they could have access to some of these medications that work well in type one diabetes that aren't indicated. And then, on the other hand, we had a lot of discussion, sort of on the street discussion, with scientists that were saying, you know, talking about this whole idea, like look at breast cancer, it was sort of one and done 20 years ago, and now it's very personalized. I know there's hesitation uh, from some scientists about cutting, you know, the population into endotypes for market appreciation <laughs> values from companies or market interests from companies. But, you know, that's what happened with breast cancer. It really moved towards personalized medicine. And that's how, you know, and, and then, and then uh, those who had certain endotypes had certain treatments and those became even, you could see the, they were even more effective in certain groups. I think that's that's what uh, Jay is talking about here. Um, and also I wanted to sort of 
you know, highlight your question, Brandon, that you said very early, uh, which was great. Given the data that's been generated thus far, evaluating these different indices for both prediction and detection, how should the field consider incorporating these types of metabolic measures for trial study design? And should different measures be used in different groups? So is, you know, who, who is going to drive that question or drive that change in the way TrialNet and FDA does business? Well, I, I alluded to that, by the way, you know, in my the last slide, that I, I think we need to at least look a very, uh, we need to look at these measures in a prospective way and, you know, and not just sort of uh, in a sloppily in a in a post hoc way. So that's a, that's a start. Uh, and and I I think that one one way you can do this to sort of sneak it in is to say, look, we're interested in mechanistic effects. And I know everybody's interested, but they're sort of done often after the fact and and not necessarily plan with great planning. But uh, I think if we if we look at it that way, we're yes, we're looking for a diagnosis, but we're also looking at mechanism, you know, as it's just as important. And I think what might happen, I it might take years, or it might not take years, that there'll be an evolution when we see how important mechanism is for efficacy to, to get to, to to find specificity of efficacy. I'm a huge believer in that. I mean, if you we'll, can't, you know, otherwise you're sort of throwing darts at a a target. If you know understand the etiology of a disease, then you can really address it, right? So, so I, I I like uh, Marie and Brandon to uh, really push for, because <laughs> I don't have much to do with the trials. <laughs> okay, so it's up to that's answering the question. Then it's Maria and Brandon, uh, <laughs> and I guess Maria's point before she had to go was her question. Building on Matthias' great point, do you think that endpoints with C peptide will increase specificity of response to treatments that aim to restore beta cell function? Not necessarily other mechanisms of diabetes. Example, an example, insulin resistance, and she said number to treat. Of course, is an important concept. Well, if you look at C peptide alone, since C, C peptide is such a function of in, of insulin resistance, I'll, I'll just say this to show you how complicated it is. And Brandon knows this. Brandon and I worked, and I should have. I didn't put Brandon's work in here because he's done a lot of stuff. But it it wasn't really relevant to the talk, and I didn't have. That's enough okay. Time. We'll have him next. <laughs> but but I, I was just going to say I was just going to say that uh, if you look at the AUCC peptide, just to show you how difficult it is, versus the independent uh, the dependent fraction, it, you see that it's inverse, which you'd expect that C peptide goes down, you know, and secretion is is down, right? But if you look at the independent fraction. It's positive. It's almost exactly the mirror image. So I, you can't just look at C peptide, uh, or and you can't just look at glucose. You have to, I think, look at them in an integrated way. Look at both of them together with a CGM. <laughs> with, <laughs> well, you could CGM is tougher in a way, uh, but you can, you can certainly. Actually, I've been. I think people are thinking about doing OGTTs and CGM to oh, really okay. get to the the, the, the best point. And then maybe you might even start, you know, imagining or dreaming about, you know, a treatment plan that is, you know, an infusion of teplizumab and then some verapamil and then some GLP-1. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is all, you know, really uh, kind of tongue in cheek, but. Well, they talk about this in trial net. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but maybe it's going to be, you know, a, um, a staged attack. Yeah. Um, and I think these data that you guys are generating and the way you're thinking about it is so helpful and really is going to drive, um, you know, the clinical trials forward into fruition to for better treatment plans. So thank you so very much. Uh, I want to thank you for having me. I really uh, enjoyed this. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much. And we'll, uh, Brandon, th uh, Dr. Nathan, we'll be reaching out to you next. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jay. Bye-bye.